working with finite limits. So far, I've given you a real life example. I've given you the definition of a limit, meaning as we approach it from either direction and they have to meet in the middle. And that helped us to answer our real life example using a table by estimating it. We saw some visuals and how to come up with answers to homework problems by given a graph. But now let's figure out how to do it when they actually give us functions. And so this is what I'm going to call finding limits by using computational techniques. So we're actually going to compute things using algebra here. So to find finite limits, which is what we're focusing on in this section, in the next section we'll focus on infinite limits. The first step you do is just like you were to evaluate the function. What you want to do is you want to substitute in the x value. Now I've told you most of the time the limit as x approaches a of our function is exactly equal to our function itself. And that leads us into case number one. If I substitute in my x value, then if no problems arrive, we actually have our answer. No big deal. Our function is the exact same thing as our limit. So if I go back to the graph visual that we had in the last video, an example of this would happen like right here at 12. My functions define at that point and my limit also approaches that point. That also was a perfect example of three right here because I have a point defined there, whether it is denoted or not denoted. My function is defined there, and my graph also leads me to the exact same place. So this is when functions and limits happen to be the exact same thing, when nothing tricky is happening. And again, we find those by just substituting in the x value, simplifying, and then we get our resulting limit. Another situation that may come about is if I substitute in my x value into my limit, meaning I substitute my a into my function, if I get something divided by 0, what's going to happen is we don't have to do any work whatsoever. Our answer is automatically going to be d and e, meaning it does not exist. Because if we go back to um, graphing rational expressions, we know we got zero in the denominator when our function is undefined. And we graph that by using a vertical asymptote. So if I have a vertical asymptote, what's happening is the graph is going to follow that vertical asymptote from one direction, and it's going to follow the vertical asymptote from the opposite direction most of the time. Hopefully you figured that out. Our graphs approach it from opposite directions. We know that the limit from the left has to match the limit from the right. So since that does not happen, our limit in this instance does not exist. So that's the reason if we get something divided by zero, our limit does not exist because we have a vertical asymptote there. And almost all the time, our graph approaches it at different directions. Another situation that came about here is if we get zero in the numerator and zero in the denominator. What that does, hopefully you remember again from graphing the rational equations video, is that creates a hole in the graph. Now, if I'm looking for when my function is defined, that hole would tell me my function is not defined there. But remember, limits don't care what's happening at that specific point. They care about what's happening approaching that specific point. So let me go back to, again, my visual happening here. An example of this is here at negative 4. I have a hole in my graph at negative 4, but I see my graph is approaching it from this direction, approaching it from that direction. So that means my limit here is at 6. So I don't care that there's a hole there. I care about what y value I'm approaching. So to get that y value, to solve it computational-wise, we have to do additional work, meaning something from the numerator and something from the denominator has going to cancel. So typically ways that we get that to happen is by factoring, rationalizing if you have a square root involved. And notice I left part C blank 
because you might have to be creative here. But most of the time, it's going to be happening by factoring or rationalizing. So these are the ways that we're going to solve finite limits computational-wise. So now that I've given you the steps, let's go ahead and see some examples of these. My first example, the limit as x is approaching 2, and notice I don't see f of x or something like that that we've typically been seeing because I've already substituting in what our function is, x squared plus 4x minus 7. So going back to our steps here, the first thing that we do is we substitute in our x value, and then we move on from there. So the first thing that I do is I substitute in my x value for this function. So that gives me 2 squared plus 4 times 2 minus 7. If I don't have any problems, like I do not see here, I just simplify, and that answer gives me my, in fact, answer. So 2 squared gives me 4 plus 4 times 2 gives me 8. When I subtract 7, that gives me 5. So my limit as x is approaching 2 of my function, x squared plus 4x minus 7, that is equivalent to 5. So that's my whole answer here. Now, since there were no problems in this instance, that's when my function, so if I wanted to do f of 2, is exactly the same as my limit, is exactly the same as 5 here. And if I were to graph this, if you wanted to see the visual that went along with this, if I were to graph this, I would have an ordered pair. I would have a point on my graph of 2 and 5. So both of these, function notation-wise and limit notation-wise, tell me that I have an ordered pair of 2, 5, and my graph is approaching that ordered pair from both directions. Now, if you're a visual person like I am, perhaps you actually want to double check this and you want to see that ordered pair 2, 5 on our graph. So I'm going to utilize my graphing calculator here. x squared plus 4x minus 7. I have it substituted in for my y, so I can graph this. I'm going to graph it on the standard window of zoom 6. Hopefully you know what this graph looks like. Since it's a degree 2, it is a parabola. This parabola it has a positive leading coefficient, so it's opening up. So that means I have at least the right image that I'm looking for here. I want to look what's happening at specifically x approaching 2. So I do that by second calc. I look at my specific value, so I type in 1 or enter. Down here, it's telling me to substitute in what x value I'm looking at, which is 2. And I hit enter and that gives me my y value of 5. So not only do I see my point defined at 2, 5, but I see my graph is approaching that point from the left, and my graph is approaching that point from the right. Hence, my limit is the same as what my point is defined for. Let's look at a second example of how to do these computationally. So I have the limit as x is approaching 3 of 4x plus 7 over 3 plus x. I suggest that you pause the video and see if you can come up to the answer with this one on your own. Again, if I go back to my steps, the first thing that I do is I substitute in my x value and I see what happens from there. So this gives me 4 times 3 plus 7 over 3 plus my x value of 3. On the top, 12 plus 7 gives me 19. On the bottom, 3 plus 3 gives me 6. I didn't have any problems happening in this example, so therefore I have my actual answer, 19 over Since there were no problems, this is the same thing as finding my function of 3, and it would also, of course, be the exact same thing here. Now, if you wanted to see this visually, I encourage you to do so. I plug in my function into my graphing calculator, 4x plus 7 over 3 plus x. Or you could graph this by hand, since we've learned all of those steps in the last 
set of videos. Graphing rational functions, you could come up with your y-intercepts, your x-intercepts, your vertical asymptotes, your horizontal or oblique asymptotes. Let me go ahead and graph this again on the standard window, zoom six. Gives me this graph here. If I wanted to look at three, I need to type that in. I could keep doing my second calc value feature, or let me show you an even quicker way to do it. If you type in just trace, you can here substitute in your x value. So we're looking at x is equal to 3. So I typed in trace, I type in 3, and I hit enter. That gives me the point of 3.16 repeating, which is the same thing as 19 over 6. I see that my point is defined there, meaning that's my function of that. And I see my graph approaching from the left and approaching from the right also meets that point there, meaning my limit is equal to 19 over 6. I'm going to stop this video here, but in the next video, I'm going to be doing some more examples of how to find limits using computational techniques.